Uh, okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, so <coughs> it's a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Alfio Quarteroni, uh, who is very well known uh, to the EPFL community as he has been for 20 years professor in, in mathematics uh, and head of the chair of, um, I don't remember the name of your chair, <laughs> and modeling and um, I have written here, modeling and scientific computing <laughs> here at EPFL, and he has been very influential in establishing uh, computational science at, uh, at EPFL and uh, worldwide. Um, so it's impossible to summarize uh, the great achievements of Alfio in, uh, in just a few words. So let me just mention that uh, uh, he has um, a recipient of two uh, ERC advanced grants uh, and two uh, ERC proof of concepts uh, in the uh, themes of uh, uh, cardiovascular mathematics. Um, he has uh, many more awards and, uh, and honors, and uh, he has uh, authored like 400 papers and 25 books, and many of those books have really educated a whole um, generation of numerical analysts, me included. Um, so it's, uh, without further delay, I leave the floor to, to Alfio for his talk on physics-based and data-driven based algorithms for simulation of uh, the heart function. So thank you, Fabio. Thank you for uh, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here, to be back at EPFL. Um, as you see, the title is not that different in uh, the substance uh, with respect to what Eleni has been talking about before, right? Uh, the, my emphasis would be on a different type of application. Um, so um, uh, this is a very, uh, I would say, kind of dogmatic uh, view of uh, um, what uh, can be done in, in scientific computing. You see in the upper part, uh, the uh, physics-based models, and in the lower part, the data-driven models, say. So as you know, uh, when we are dealing with physics-based models, uh, uh, we start from data, very few data indeed, the right number of data. You don't need many data. You need the data that are uh, demanded from uh, the specific uh, partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations that is going to be used. And then uh, um, the value is here in this box where we have the model. And the model is indeed uh, made typically of two subsets of equations. Uh, the first principal equations, those that stem from physics, physics in a general context. Could be physics, could be biology, could be finance, could be uh, demography. Uh, and then typically you have uh, what is less clean, what are called the constitutive relations. Uh, and those depend, for instance, on the material uh, properties that you are addressing, or the fluid, or uh, the biological tissue that you are considering. So typically you have data and you have a solution that we call U. Typically mathematicians call the solution U unknown, right? And then you are interested in an output which might depend on U. So let's say Y of U. So the model is it's a transfer function between the data and the output in this case. So we call typically this a white box model. White box because everything is clear. It depends on the physics, right? And depends on the mathematical translation of the physics. And then on the lower part, you have uh, all what is uh, driven by data. You need data, hopefully many data, or say a good number of data. And if it's a supervised uh, training artificial neural network, for instance, you need couples of data and the corresponding output. So you train your network, and then you have a new data, and uh, you want to compute the output that is corresponding to this uh, uh, new data. This is a very simple uh, kind of neural network, but this is basically the main difference between the two approaches. Right, so I'll try to um, address this uh, uh, virtual separation, but indeed, again, what counts is the fusion between the two approaches uh, on a specific example. And the specific example is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the heart function. So we try to com compute, actually to construct a model uh, which is capable of uh, uh, describing the heart function. So uh, I guess uh, we all have an idea on the way the heart is working. Um, first of all, as a pump, we typically say that the heart is a pump. Uh, it is made of four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. The ventricles are in the lower part, the atria in the upper part. So the venous blood is entering the, blood, the, the heart from uh, the vena cava. It enters the um, uh, right atrium, then it passes through this valve into the uh, uh, right ventricle, and then is ejected into this pulmonary artery that goes to the lungs, 
where there is an exchange of substances. So CO2 and other toxic substances are released and, uh, and the uh, oxygen is uh, intaken and it is brought back to the, uh, to the heart uh, through the pulmonary veins. There are four pulmonary veins that bring back the oxygenated blood to the heart, to the upper part of the uh, left heart, which is called the left atrium, and then through this valve, which is called the mitral valve, it enters into the left ventricle. And when the left ventricle squeezes, and this occurs in the so-called diastolic, so, sorry, systolic uh, phase, then the pressure of the blood here is higher enough to win the resistance of this valve, which is the aortic valve, and it enters into the aortic, uh, into the aorta. The aorta is the main artery of our body. And then through the aorta, it reaches the uh, hundreds of large arteries and the billions of capillaries, and it, uh, it goes to feed all the uh, uh, cells in our body. So this is the pumping action of the heart. Um, but why the heart does it pump? Um, what makes it pumping? Well, at every instant of our life, fortunately, we have an, a stimulus, which originates from a specific location which is called the sinoatrial node here. And, uh, uh, and this is due to the, fact, to the fact that you have some uh, uh, pacemaker cells, uh, which are biological ones. So there's nothing that you should do, fortunately. It originates an electrical field that propagates first to the upper part of the heart. And then, in a very synchronized way, to the lower part of the heart. Thank, thanks to these very high-speed highways, which are called Purkinje fibers. And this uh, stimuli reaches all the cells of our myocardium. And there, there is the formation of a, what is called an action potential. So there is a depolarization and depolarization, uh, which is due to the fact that we have every cell with specific uh, channels that open and close. And the opening of the ion cells, uh, um, ion channels, allow the um, calcium and uh, potassium and, uh, and other, say, substances to uh, go back and forth and to create a transmembrane potential. And thanks to this potential, there is a triggering force, which is called the active force, that is originated at every cell level. And this active force create, create say, a kind of uh, uh, traveling wave that propagates from one cell to the neighboring one. And those traveling waves are responsible for the contraction and the relaxation of the cardiomyocytes. And if we go to the upper level, this is a multi-scale process, we go to the upper level, this eventually will determine the contraction and the relaxation of the whole organ. So as you see, there are at least um, three uh, physical fields that are cooperating here. One is the electrical field. We need Maxwell equations to describe it, say. Then there is the uh, uh, mechanical field, and then, and then there is fluid dynamics, because we have blood in the four chambers, and blood will be affected by the contraction and the relaxation mechanism. So we have at least three fields. But in fact, we have many more, because you have to go down to the cell levels and to describe the ionic activity. And there we use the Fisnagum equations, and their generalization, and then we use constitutive equation to generate the active force at the microscopic level, and then by a knob-scale mechanism, we end up with forces at the global level, say. And on top of that, we have to account for the opening and the closing on the, of the valves, and of course, with the connection of the external circulation. So this is the conceptual model of the heart, say. We can call it the mathematical heart, right? So you see on the background, I uh, hope you see it, there are the four chambers in this idealized picture, the left atrium, the uh, right atrium, the uh, right ventricle, the left ventricle, and on every chamber, we have been overlaying uh, the typical physical processes that take place. So the electrophysiology, the generation of the active force and of the passive force at the global level, the fluid dynamics, the valve dynamics, uh, the perfusion, because our myocardium is fed by blood. And this is due to the fact that we have coronaries that take blood from the aorta and bring blood to the myocardium. And thanks to the coronaries, our myocardium is perfused by blood. Right. So uh, we have 
all these processes, and they are then connected with the rest to the other processes in the other chambers, and then they are connected with uh, the systemic circulation and the pulmonary circulation. So this is a kind of, well, is what we call an integrated heart model. Uh, it's based on every single block, it's based on uh, either partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations. All these blocks are typically nonlinear, and all these blocks, blocks are connected. So it's a globally coupled system. Uh, should we be able to solve this system, we will have the uh, key to uh, reconstruct the functioning of a human heart. So this is just a subset of the equation that we are going to use. And you see, for every block, we have the corresponding equations. So for those who know PDEs, partial differential equations, for the electrophysiology, we generate a system of nonlinear uh, reaction diffusion equations, which is coupled with a uh, system of ordinary differential equations. We describe the ion dynamics at the cell levels. For the perfusion, we have a system which is a multi-scale system, which describes, say, the fluid through the coronaries. And since we have large coronaries and then small coronaries and microscopic coronaries, we need a multi-scale system that account for the different level, different sizes of these coronaries, say. For the fluid dynamics, we have the Navistokes equations because blood is a, say, in principle, is a non-Newtonian fluid, which behaves, however, as a Newtonian fluid in the large um, uh, chambers. And uh, so we use Navistokes equations. However, the, the tricky part here is that uh, those chambers are moving, they are not fixed, and the motion of the chambers is a further unknown of the system. So we need to uh, reshape the Navistokes equation in this specific hybrid, say, environment. And then we have the equations for uh, uh, the passive mechanics. Uh, every time we have a structure, like those that we have seen before, uh, and here the myocardium is a structure, is a mechanical structure. When you operate, when you solicit the structure, the structure will deform. So we need an equation to describe this uh, structure, and we need equations to describe the, the formation of the active force at the uh, cell level. And then we, we, we need further equations to describe the dynamics of the valves, and of course we need to connect this with the external circulation. So this is what we can call the mathematical heart. Uh, what can we do with that? Well, we can go now to see every specific core model. I mean, the models that are responsible to uh, translate the specific physics that is occurring in the heart. What you see here is a heart. Um, uh, you see colors. The colors refer to the value of the transmembrane potential. Uh, there are two scales, one here for the upper part, for the atria, and one down there for the lower part, for the, for the ventricles. Uh, this is expressed in millivolt. So for the ventricles, you go from minus, minus 80 to 40, plus 40, from the atria from minus 80 to plus to plus 20, of course you see different colors, um, uh, and uh, typically you see the blue when uh, uh, the part has not yet been electrically activated, and then different colors where you already have an electrical activation. You see you have an activation first of the atria and then of the ventricle. And of course we are capable of virtually in every point, almost every point of, uh, of, of the heart to get the corresponding value and that the way it evolves in time. Um, this is the same simulation as before. Uh, you can see the front, the propagating front of the electrical field. And here on the left, you see these ISO lines, uh, which are uh, referring to the uh, um, um, ISO activation time. So line, a line will connect those points that are activated at the same time. So this is a healthy heart. Uh, and so this is a healthy map, but uh, doctors say, arithmologists or cardiologists, generally speaking, when they look at this map, they can immediately detect whether or not heart is behaving regularly, at least from the rhythm point of view. Uh, what can we do with that? Once we have a model and uh, you trust on this model, you can try to use it at the clinical level, at the clinical practice. What you see here is the ventricle, the left ventricle, a real patient. Uh, what you see on the left is the numerical simulation of the propagation electrical field. You see it's very irregular because uh, this patient ha has had uh, strokes. So there are regions with scars. Scars mean that the fibers uh, are no longer alive, so they do not allow uh, the electrical field to propagate through. 
Uh, so uh, those patients need to be ablated. Ablation means that uh, you have to basically enter with the catheter, with the camera, and then burn, literally burn, specific points which are responsible for generating this uh, bad propagation of waves, uh, what doctors call the electrical chaos, say. Uh, now, one very critical issue is that uh, you have to take the patient to the operating room. Uh, uh, he or she could stay there for a while, for a few hours, uh, two, three, or four hours typically, and the doctor start by ablating the very first point, and then they have to reconstruct the map, the electrical map, and, uh, and proceeding sequentially in this way. So this is very, I would say, invasive from one side, and also very heuristical from the other side. Uh, so we try to use them in... Uh, locating what are called the biomarkers, those area or those lines uh, of blocks, and, uh, and, the, and the points, sorry, and ideally, the points where uh, um, op optimally, say, uh, we should uh, um, uh, ablate. So we try to reduce the time of the operation and uh, for the patient and uh, to reduce the number of ablations and uh, spotting the right point, uh, the optimal points where one should ablate. Now, this was the electrophysiology. This is just the description of electrical field. And actually, if you talk with the arithmologists, this is what they, they care about. Uh, now, the point is that you need to account for the mechanical deformation. So you need to have a system of equation that is capable of describing both the electrophysiology, generation electrical field, and the mechanical deformation. So this is one of the very first examples, as, as far as I know, uh, where you can see the four chambers beating in a, a a reasonably correct way, I would say. Uh, you see on the right-hand side the color map, which identifies the deformation, uh, the modulus of this vector, D, which is the deformation, the three-dimensional vector. It has three components. It, it gives you, for every single point, uh, the deformation in the three directions. Uh, so uh, you, you see this is, a, this is a large deformation. We go from zero up to uh, two centimeters. So there's the deformation of the, of the, of the heart. Um, and on the left-hand side, you see the same simulation, but now the color refer to the concentration of the calcium ions. So you see the way the calcium ions are behaving on the whole uh, myocardium, say. So again, this is a healthy heart, and this is a reconstruction of uh, the deformation of this healthy heart, where we, account, we are accounting for the electrophysiology and the mechanical deformation. So just to give you an idea, this will take for about a couple of uh, weeks on a big cluster of the European scale, say, to simulate just one second of a heart, so just one heartbeat. So this is uh, what uh, 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 was called before a full order model or high fidelity model. So we're using, in this case, finite elements or spectral element methods to have this type of simulation. And, uh, and of course, since the very nature, physical nature of the problem is so complex, uh, you need uh, a lot of, uh, say, computational power and of course, appropriate numerical methods. Now is the turn of the fluid dynamics. So we want to reconstruct what's happening in the, within the heart. And what you see here, this is the left heart, uh, the left part of the heart. You see the left atrium and the left ventricle, and this is the ascending aorta. And those yellow are the two valves. So the mitral valve, which connects the, the, the atrium with the ventricle, and then the aortic valve, which connects the ventricle with the aorta. So blood is entering through the four pulmonary veins from the lung. It stays into the left atrium until when this valve will open. Then we go down there, here. Uh, this will be inflated by, by blood, of course. This is the left ventricle. And when the pressure is uh, high enough to, to beat the resistance of this valve, the aortic valve, then, then will be ejected into the aorta. So what you see on the right hand a picture, you see the coherent structures, uh, the coherent um, uh, say, vortices, just to say. And the point is whether here, whether the, uh, the, the blood is, or, the, or the, the flow field actually here is, is turbulent or not. And in a healthy heart, uh, uh, indeed it is not turbulent, although you have a kind of permanent transition to the turbulence. And turbulence will never be achieved because basically of two facts. First one is that you have the beating nature of the heart. Uh, and then the second one is that there is not enough space uh, for the turbulence to develop completely. Uh, on, the, uh, on the middle part, you see uh, the pressure, middle picture, sorry, you see the pressure, and here you see the velocity field. So you have a complete reconstruction of, of uh, uh, the blood flow motion into the uh, left ventricle, 
uh, and the left atrium. And then, uh, if you want to reconstruct the complete uh, motion, uh, we need to connect the heart with external circulation. The heart is not in the middle of nowhere. You have to connect with external circulation. And for the external circulation, it is out of reach to use three-dimensional models because you have um, hundreds of large arteries and, uh, and thousands of mid middle-sized arteries and, and billions of capillaries. Uh, so you cannot afford using three-dimensional models, using Navier-Stokes equations everywhere. So that's why we use the analogy of the electrical circuits. So we use electrical circuits to reproduce the average quantities in space and the way they depend on time. And you connect then this uh, very complex ordinary differential equation uh, system um, outside with, uh, with the three-dimensional description of the heart. And uh, in this way, you can have a complete reconstruction of the flow field in the four chambers and, the, and in the aorta. So what you see here is just the three-dimensional analysis on the heart. However, uh, we do not impose boundary conditions for the external circulation, we actually connect this with the system of ordinary differential equations that is responsible for describing uh, the external circulation, say. Um, again, once you have a system, uh, uh, you trust to, you, you can use it also at the clinical level. For instance, here we're using it to simulate um, a, what is called the matter regurgitation. A matter regurgitation occurs because uh, the valves will not, say, close perfectly well. Uh, there should be a, a, a space through which blood can return from the lower part of the heart to the upper part of the heart. This is called regurgitation. And this might be dangerous over time because it will create different pressure, uh, a, a delta pressure on, on, on the valves, and eventually this will create fatigue and the valve will not be able to to, uh, to work correctly over time. Um, we use this model to describe some of the effect due to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pathology. Uh, we try to simulate uh, three typical, uh, uh, say, uh, problems that occur uh, in this specific context, namely the um, um, increase of the pulmonary resistances. Um, the uh, decreased oxygen saturation and uh, the increased heart rate uh, that typically accompany uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pathology, say. And uh, we try to simulate with our model the way uh, this is reflected into some, say, biomarkers or indicators that are, uh, say, uh, very, uh, um, typically used from, from the clinicians. We reconstructed the so-called PV loop. The PV loop is this kind of uh, hysteresis curve uh, which represents the behavior of the pressure with respect to the volume. The way the, pre in a ventricle, for instance, the left ventricle, the way the pressure depends on the volume. So you have uh, the uh, black curve, which is the healthy one, and we have the green curve, which is the one that corresponds to a specific, say, deterioration of these three indicators. Uh, now, what you can end up with is a macroscopic, uh, say, remark that this uh, green hysteretic loop is uh, uh, shorter than uh, the black one. And, uh, and this is important because when you take the distance between the right hand vertical line and the left hand vertical line, this horizontal distance, this is what represents the stroke volume. The stroke volume is the amount of blood that is ejected from the left ventricle. So as you see here, there is a quite remarkable reduction of the stroke volume, which means the heart is not able to eject the right amount of, uh, of, of blood. And uh, indeed, um, to restore the circulation, the correct circulation, uh, the right ventricle is uh, obliged, say, spontaneously to work much, say, uh, in a much more intensive way than usual. And this creates eventually a very important fatigue in, in, the, in the right ventricle and also create an overpressure on the flow on the lungs. So this is going eventually to further deteriorate the situation. So we try to investigate this type of feedback mechanisms that are due to the fact that some specific biomarkers are deteriorated in the case of the COVID. And that to do that, uh, we should complete our previous model with further uh, 
elements or further physical models. Uh, the first one is the description of the metabolic response of the organism. The second one is the description of the, um, say, model of oxygen transport between lung and the lungs and, and the heart. And uh, the whole thing is finalized to compute the ATP dynamics. The ATP is the adenosine triphosphate concentration, which is one of the most important triggers of the contraction of the cardiomyocytes. So as you see here, this is a, an extended uh, heart model, which accounts also for the interaction with the lungs, which is specifically appropriate to describe the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pathology. Now, uh, where do data come from? Come from? Uh, we have been discussing about the physical principles that are governing the heart functioning. Now, how do you get data? Of course, if we want to eventually utilize a digital twin, we need data from the real patients. Now, uh, we need data from clinics, say. So we have CT scan, we have seen MRI, we, are, we, are, we, are, we have late uh, uh, gadolinium enhancement MRI. And, uh, and phase contrast MRI, all classical techniques that are used at the clinical level to, to investigate, um, say, uh, the healthiness or, or pathological, say, situation of specific patients. Uh, we use CT scan uh, to, um, uh, to reconstruct, for instance, the coronaries or the shape of the ventricle. Uh, we use CIN MRI to compute the dynamics of the ventricle, so the motion of the external surface which is called the epicardium. Uh, we, we use LGE MRI uh, and phase contrast to um, say, to compute the boundary conditions, what happens at the external part of the heart, say, from one side, and also to find the scars for a heart which has been uh, affected by, by stroke, say. So we need different type of data to compute different, say, different type of clinical data to compute different type of data that are that are, that are used to fit the mathematical model. Uh, once we have those data, we need to end up with uh, shapes. This is the very first, uh, say, duty, right? We need a shape of that specific art, the specific art of, specific, of, of the specific patient. And of course, there's a lot of activity here, which is based on, say, geometric analysis, to start with uh, clinical data and, and to end up with shapes. And once you have shapes, you need a grid. A grid is the way you reproduce uh, surfaces or volumes uh, by the help of uh, elementary geometrical structures. Because at the end of the computation, uh, you will have information on every element of this grid. So it could be triangles or quadrilaterals on surfaces. It could be hexahedra or tetrahedra on, on volume, say. And uh, the size of the grid uh, the fineness of the grid will determine a priori the quality or the accuracy of the solution that we get at the very end. So um, the larger the number of points or number of uh, elementary structure we are using here, uh, potentially the better the accuracy. But of course, uh, the higher the computational complexity. So it's always a matter of a compromise or trade-off between the accuracy you are aiming at and the, uh, the computational efficiency you can uh, you can afford, competition complexity we, you can afford. Uh, these are just two examples, right? Uh, these are two examples of grids, and uh, this is the, the finest grid that we are using. We are using up to 60 million of hexahedra to, to uh, say, to, read, to describe the volume, uh, to fill the volume of the chambers for the fluid dynamics, and also to fill the myocardium, and this is where we'll be solving the electrophysiology problems as well as the mechanical problem. There's another issue which is very important and uh, is about the missing data. And, and uh, in, in, in biological applications, very often you miss data, unfortunately. I mean, you miss the basic data that are needed for the model, right? And this is a very important example, and which has to see with the uh, fibers, uh, the fibers that are paving our myocardium. And, uh, and now, uh, the fibers are very important in, uh, at, at, uh, at, at the modeling level because uh, through the fibers, uh, you have uh, the conduction of the electrical signal from one side. And besides, the fibers, when you have the torsion of the heart, which is important to, 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 to let the heart playing its role of a pump, uh, well, this torsion is made possible because of the fact that you have fibers uh, that uh, 
uh, are undergoing a very important and, and, and severe uh, torsion, say. So how do we get fibers? They're not available from, from, from the clinics. Um, or sometimes you may have them from diffusion tensor MRI, which, however, from one side is very noisy, produces very noisy images, and on the other side is not available in every possible hospital, right? You may have it in uh, university hospitals, but not, not everywhere. So uh, 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 as, uh, as much as it can look uh, arbitrary, we use mathematics to deduce the fiber distribution. So we start from some elementary information, for instance, the uh, orientation of the fibers at the epicardium and the endocardium, and you try to recompute the uh, orientation of the fiber, fibers transmurally, the way they change their angle when they go from the epicardium to the endocardium. And you solve partial differential equations um, uh, to, uh, to end up with the fiber field. Uh, and as I was saying before, fibers are very important because they are in the uh, conductivity tensor for the Maxwell equations, and, the, and, and they are part of the piola kirchhoff tensor when uh, we have to deduce the deformation the of, the, of the heart. And this is uh, an example where I hope you can see it, because it's very clear, uh, uh, it's very light, but you can see that uh, there is a uh, red color for the epicardium fibers, and then there is a blue color for the endocardium fiber. And you have an orientation that changes from the epicardium to the endocardium transmurally, and this is computed mathematically by solving system of partial differential equations, basically trying to end up with the geodesic uh, of the fibers and, uh, and solving a potential problem that is used then uh, to be differentiated and, and to produce a system of uh, um, a frame of reference for, uh, for, the, for the fibers, say. Um, now, uh, there are virtually infinitely many applications that you can afford once you have a trustable mathematical model for the heart. Of course, I have no time to go through those applications in a, say, uh, with, the, with the due time. Uh, I'm, I'm just giving you some postcards. So just one slide for application. I'm just selecting on three or four different applications just to tell you the uh, uh, variety of problems you can, you can address. Um, this is uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. This is a collaboration with Johns Hopkins uh, University. Uh, we try to indeed here construct a digital twin before the operation, uh, before going to the, uh, to, the, to the operating room to try to see the way uh, the um, a patient with uh, scars, uh, which previous infarct, uh, can undergo uh, a surgery in order to reconstruct uh, somehow to uh, recover a m m more or less regular uh, heartbeat. Uh, and, uh, and this is based on uh, the electrophysiology investigation that I presented before. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, ablation. Uh, here, uh, we try to use, uh, again, the electrophysiology. So again, the main, uh, um, say, uh, customer, uh, if you can say so, of this type of application are the arrhythmologists. Uh, we try to find the biomarkers uh, of, uh, of uh, this specific patient, finding the ASMOS and the lines of block and the regions where you have an outer loop. Uh, the, all those are responsible for this very chaotic behavior of, uh, of, uh, of, the, 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 um, of the electrical field in, in, in this patient, and uh, ending up with the ideal position of the uh, um, um, points where uh, one should ablate. And this is in collaboration with uh, um, the um, San Rafael Hospital in Milano. Um, this is a systolic obstruction. Uh, now it's a matter of fluid dynamics. Um, in, in, in this specific context, uh, we have patients with, uh, uh, say, uh, 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 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It means that the septum, septum is the region that separates the left part of the heart from the right part of the heart. The septum is a bit hypertrophic. This means that uh, uh, during the ejection phase from the left ventricle, uh, the uh, the, the, the um, aortic valve does not open 
uh, completely because of this obstruction. So the point is that doctors can uh, should intervene here uh, to literally ablate, so remove a portion of the septum, and this uh, computation is finalized to identify the optimal region or the suggested region where uh, this uh, uh, ablation could be, um, or this, uh, say, removal uh, could be operated. Of course, in this case, you have to compute the fluid dynamics before the operation and after the operation, compute the forces on the, on the valve, on the aortic valve, and ending up by identifying the right portion of the ideal portion of, uh, of uh, the septum to be, to be removed. Uh, this is the cardiac resynchronization therapy. Now you have a heart that is beating very regularly, and uh, one uh, typical operation is to uh, uh, try to implant uh, uh, two, uh, uh, say, pacemaker with two um, electrodes, typically one in the septum and the other one in the uh, myocardium, typically on the left part of the myocardium. Now, uh, uh, the, the, the classical operation is made in a way that doctors enter with a catheter and they try in the, say, one of the most important coronaries, and they go further and further and further and try to detect the point, which is the latest activation point electrically, the point where the electrical signal uh, arrives at the latest possible time. So typically, this is the point where one of the two electrodes are placed. So we try to help them by, uh, say, reducing the uh, uh, how to say, the invasivity of this operation, so there's no need to go up to the very end. You can stick at the very beginning and I reconstruct the electrical field uh, numerically and uh, identify the position uh, without going further away in, uh, in, the, in the coronary, say. And on the other side, we try to suggest a possible best way to locate the best location for the two electrodes. So one is an optimality principle that is, uh, say, um, um, followed here, and the other one is try to be less invasive for the patient as possible. Um, now, I've been talking about physical models, and uh, and uh, and uh, we have seen pictures, uh, and you've seen uh, movies, uh, but I basically said almost nothing about numerical models, and uh, no time to to go into the details, but I'd like at least to list the most important, I would say here, or critical uh, issues. Uh, the first one is how you capture multiple scales. You have multiple scale in time and multiple scale in space. Sorry, in time, the vertical line here, and the space. Uh, in space, you go from nanometers, uh, where the force generation is, uh, where the force is generated at, 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 the, at the cell level, to the centimeter, which is the size of the heart. And in time, you go from microseconds to seconds. Second is a heartbeat, right? You go from microseconds, uh, which is again uh, the characteristic time for the generation of the force at the cell level, to the millisecond, which is the characteristic time of the electrophysiology of the, uh, say, electrical field, the propagation of the electrical field, to the seconds, which is the characteristic, characteristic time of the, of the heartbeat. So you need methods, mathematical models and numerical models that are able to capture the multiple scales. Uh, you have lack of data. You have very few data indeed. We miss uh, initial conditions, boundary conditions, coefficients that characterize material behavior, for instance. Um, so you need to uh, somehow uh, use surrogate models to, uh, to construct this data. Um, you have, uh, well, that's a bit too technical. Geometrical nonconformity means that the grids for the myocardium and the, and, the, and the chambers are different, so you have to adjust them in a, they're, they're discontinuous, you have to adjust them uh, in a suitable way, and of course, uh, the um, numerical reconstruction of different um, variables uh, is based on polynomials of different uh, with different values. Um, you need splitting algorithms because the complete IR model is a monster model; you'll never be able to treat it algebraically as is. So you need to split it, and when you split it in the different components, in the different physical components, you generate errors, which is called splitting errors. So you need to keep those errors under control, for both for accuracy and for stability. Uh, you need scalable preconditioners because we end up with uh, models that have, uh, say, tens of millions of degrees of freedom, or sometimes hundreds of millions of degrees of freedom, and uh, you have a very strong uh, uh, stiffness, uh, uh, numerical stiffness, in the sense that if you look at the eigenvalues of the global model after linearization, you have eigenvalues that behave in a completely different way. So the minimum, the maximum over the minimum, which is called the condition number, is gigantically high. So you need uh, preconditioners. 
uh, and those preconditioners uh, should be optimal, hopefully, that is, um, the condition number of the preconditioned system should be independent of uh, the size of the numerical problem and scalable. So they should scale properly uh, with the number of uh, processors that we're going to be used. Uh, we use model order reduction, and Eleni has been uh, talking a lot about MOR before. Uh, we want to get, go from the 10, million, 10 millions of uh, dimension up to a, a few hundred, sometimes a few thousand, right? And, and we use uh, 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 singular variable decomposition, principal component analysis, uh, uh, greedy algorithms, and the Galerkin projections. You have seen these words before to end up with a reduced system. We need to account for variability and uncertainty. Of course, we're talking about the human beings. And, uh, and we need sensitivity analysis to end up with coefficients that are reasonable for that specific uh, patient. Say. Now, uh, all this is based on um, physics-based principles, right? Physics-based models. Uh, but indeed, uh, indeed uh, we, we are using a lot, and I would say that we are today almost invariably using uh, uh, machine learning algorithms to um, uh, well, with different purposes, uh, uh, but always together with the physics-based principle. There is no need to talk about artificial neural networks here. I'm sure the fact that uh, the artificial neural networks, you can have uh, density properties or density theorem, meaning that uh, uh, you, you can uh, find a suitable artificial neural network that are capable of reproducing input-output function with an arbitrary degree of accuracy, Theoretically, now this is a theoretical result, there are plenty of theoretical results in this area, but, but most often they are not constructive. So you do not know which indeed artificial neural network is capable of uh, letting you to achieve an accuracy of order epsilon, say, once you visit epsilon. Um, we, we use uh, fully connected networks and uh, autoencoders, uh, and, uh, and we try to take advantage of uh, the fusion between uh, uh, artificial neural network and uh, physics-based models. And uh, we do that because, uh, well, I mean, we're very much influenced by this type of statement that uh, is uh, uh, on the SAM review a few years ago. Of course, this is on, from a numerical side community, right, numerical analysis community, so it's a bit biased, but I think that there is some truth in that. Uh, the knowledge incorporated in the mathematical model is essential to make predictions outside the range of the training data set to account for variations of the system, what happens if you change uh, the, the rules of the game and to come for variability, missing data, and errors. Um, so uh, we have basically four ingredients, partial differential equations. We have seen many of those before. We have high fidelity models or full order models, uh, like those based on finite elements or finite volumes or spectral elements. We have artificial neural network and, 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 and we have model order reduction or, or reduced order models. Say. So we basically try to let those four uh, actors interplay one another, depending upon the specific application you have in mind. So we have physics-based models, and, and then you have machine learning models, right? Uh, this is based on a mechanistic understanding and the principle of causality. And those are based on correlations, they're digesting big amounts of data. Uh, now, indeed, we know that there is plenty of way to let these two words uh, um, collaborate. First of all, we can use physics-based models to regularize. Uh, machine learning algorithms to avoid overfitting. So in the loss function, you had an extra term which accounts for the uh, residual of the partial differential equations we are going to solve. Uh, to produce new data uh, when data are not enough to train the network. For instance, in the clinical level, very often uh, you need too few patients that who can feed by their data the, 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 the artificial neural network. So that's why we use uh, a physics-based model to produce new data. Uh, on the other side, uh, we use machine learning algorithms, artificial neural networks algorithms, uh, to realize model reduction. So many of our model reduction algorithms are actually based on the use of artificial neural networks. Uh, we use them to uncover constitutive laws. Uh, now, uh, in the ideal physical world, we know everything about the process you are dealing with. In practice, often uh, there is something that is missing. For instance, the constitutive equations that characterize specific behavior of fluid or, 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 or material, say. So in those cases, uh, we use artificial neural network to try to, on the basis of the observations, to try to describe, not analytically, of course, not 
under the form of a formula, but to describe the effect of constitutive laws. Uh, we use them for parameter estimation to solve inverse problems. We have seen a beautiful example before for the sensitivity analysis, for the ancillary quantification. So as you see, the two worlds are actually already cooperating a lot, in fact. Or there is, say, plenty of room for them to cooperate, to produce something that individually the two approaches would not be able to, to, to provide. Um, now, there are many examples that I could make here. Um, uh, one of uh, uh, the latest um, say, discoveries or approaches that uh, have gained a lot of, uh, say, attention in the, um, I would say, engineering community is uh, uh, the one of PINN, the Physics Informed Neural Networks. So uh, just for those who are not aware of that, if we have a problem which is expressed by a partial differential equation, it could be linear or nonlinear, it could be steady or unsteady, and which depends on parameter mu, say, uh, then, uh, uh, then the loss function, instead of being on, when you use artificial neural network, instead of being only based on the discrepancy between what the, the, the network predicts and the data for the training set, well, this loss function includes extra terms, which are basically the residual of the partial differential equation and the residual of the boundary conditions. So we want to help somehow the neural network to learn the physical behavior of the system. Um, this is one way, right? Um, you start from coordinates and uh, uh, you let your artificial neural network to work. And of course, it depends on the coordinates, space coordinates, or, the, or the, say, the, the input data. And, uh, and the parameters or the hyperparameters, you can take them a virtual, actually automatic differentiation of, uh, of the result that has been produced, for instance, specific points, the collocation points, and by this automatic differentiation, you can reconstruct the output of the neural network in terms of partial differential equations, basically. Um, we, we have used multi-fidelity, uh, P-I-N-N, uh, multi-fidelity because, uh, well, in the case where we have low data or very high noise, which is very often the case in biological applications, in medical applications. Uh, we express our PD solution as the combination of a low fidelity guess uh, and, uh, and a high fidelity correction, say. Um, we, you have here just one example of the way it operates, right? You, have, you start from numerical simulations. Uh, we, we, we feed our neural network by the results of our numerical simulation. You obtain the solution. We pass it to this uh, corrective, uh, say, step where, you've, where we use a PINN method, and we produce a solution that we then use to correct the previously computed solution, basically. Um, we try to compute emulators. Uh, we try to compute emulators, namely to uh, help the neural network to learn the physical process. Again, not in the form of a PDE, of an equation but in the form of the, again, input-output uh, relationship. Uh, so we build a computationally inexpensive surrogate of the high-fidelity solver, uh, which is, say, finite element or whatever-based solver, which is able to approximate uh, the solution for a given parameter mu. Uh, we, we use it uh, to compute uh, uh, what happens, for instance, at the microscopic level in the myocardium, where we do not have basic physical principles. And the idea here is to have the neural network operating on the right-hand side of a differential equation, of a system of differential equation. So to learn the right-hand side, basically. Uh, so you compute a dynamical system, and uh, we are again combining the high-fidelity model to collect the snapshots through which we'll uh, train our neural network and uh, to end up with learning the way the constitutive law will operate at uh, every single point. And uh, of course, we may exhibit, say, the uh, gain that you have in terms of memory usage. Uh, we basically save uh, two order of uh, magnitude of memory uh, space and, uh, and 10 times uh, the, 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 the computational time. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, by just a final, uh, say, 
uh, picture, uh, which is uh, uh, very much focused on the, on the application that I've been uh, presenting this morning, um, which was the reconstruction of the uh, uh, heart function and its uh, usage at the clinical level. Of course, you can think of using it for every other type of pathologies uh, that may occur at the physical in, in the clinical in the clinical environment. So we start from patient, right? We start from a specific patient, and uh, uh, through imaging or to catheter-based measurements or just looking at the clinical history and the comorbidity, comorbidities, so this is what is produced at the clinical level, uh, we compute shapes, morphologies, biomarkers, and clinical indicators using physical models, mathematical, say, physics-based mathematical models. So we're learning from physics. And we learn from data because as seen the way we can uh, get the interplay between or fuse, say, um, mathematical models and, uh, and data-driven models, say. Um, we then compare with the population. Uh, sorry, the sequence here is not correct. It does not matter. Uh, we then compare the population. We compare the population and, uh, and we create a virtual population because once you have a mathematical model, you can create a virtual population. You can create numerical solutions that are going to feed the database of, say, the population, the relevant population. With that, we have our digital twin, if you can call it this way, and as you see, this is really the interplay between uh, the uh, learning from physics, uh, learning from data, and, and, and statistical learning, say, and, uh, and, and hopefully we can uh, try to help uh, doctors to improve diagnosis, uh, to uh, create or to realize optimal surgery or optimal devices, and uh, to devise a uh, suitable therapy plan. Therapy therapy planning. So we started from the patient, and we ended up with the patient. So this is the uh, kind of closed loop uh, system where you actually see that uh, uh, data, uh, uh, l l mathematical learning uh, and physical learning uh, is, uh, is, is, is very relevant. So I think my time is more or less over. And I, yeah, okay, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Alfie, for this uh, exciting talk. So we have time for questions uh, from the audience or from who is monitoring the chat. <laughs> Eleni, please. Uh, sorry, who is microphone is coming? <laughs> Great, thanks. So. Um, I look at your presentation and I'm actually at awe of the level of understanding you have over the functioning of uh, the human heart. And I come to wonder, for developing such models, um, is it necessary to develop this level of understanding and then how does one achieve it to, you know, to deliver a mathematical formalization? Because I imagine you needed to exchange with uh, obviously clinical doctors um, or, or diverse um, uh, representatives of various disciplines to come to this kind of... Uh, you know, a fundamental understanding level. What would you advise? Because to me, this is characteristic of the need of digital twins, right? To have this sort of holistic approach to the representation. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, well, uh, we started long ago with the, uh, not with the heart, with the external circulation, because, um, I mean, there were doctors coming to me and uh, asking if I had any idea on the way the, uh, say, the aorta or the coronaries or the uh, carotid artery uh, function in, uh, in a situation where you have plaques or you have specific pathological uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, so we started long ago, and, uh, and then more recently, about five years ago, we decided to move to the art. So um, as you say, uh, you need a long training of uh, discussion and uh, dialogue with doctors, and um, the purpose is, uh, is twofold for me. The first one is that I, I want to... Uh, learn enough to realize a holistic model. Uh, one is capable of reproducing the actual behavior of uh, the heart, of the external circulation, of uh, some crucial organ of the of human being, say. Um, so this is mathematical curiosity, if you want. Of course, you do not have to depart from the reality, because otherwise this would be a toy that will only be used by mathematicians. But say, this for me has the role of replacing or complementing uh, the book of physiology or the clinical images. It's something more that you provide to doctors. And secondly, once you have this and you trust this, you want to address specific questions. And, and, and here comes the difficulty. Uh, then uh, there are specific, doc I mean, doctors who come with specific requests. 
They don't care about the, all this uh, uh, mess, right? And they don't have to show them the mess because they, by definition, will not trust it, right? But they come with questions, and what is very important to me is to be able to understand the question from their side. So what are they looking for? And, uh, and, and then uh, you have to devise an answer that is an answer to that specific question. So you have to always to accept a compromise between uh, the beauty of the solution, uh, the accuracy, and, uh, and their actual needs. And, uh, and what you discover is that typically if you enter a hospital, also in a cardiology department, you see doctors who have different type of specialties. So those who are operating on coronaries, they don't necessarily know, say, in depth, the problems of uh, the rhythm and vice versa. And, and, and what you discover is that eventually we can know more than them. Of course, not at the level of uh, putting our hands on patients, never. But uh, to have a complete picture, to complete vision, because it's, uh, everything is coupled together. And uh, we, the scientists, have the possibility and the capability of understanding the uh, relationships, the nonlinearities, and the fact that very minor uh, little changes in one specific item or coefficient or boundary condition can determine a big mistake or big difference in, in the outcome. So it's a long exercise, but uh, to me it's a sort of file being done. I have actually a question <laughs> following up on uh, Eleni's uh, question. There is some echoes. Um, so you presented a very, very complex uh, uh, model taking into account all aspects of electrophysiology, mechanic, uh, mechanical deformation, fluid dynamics, uh, uh, valves, uh, uh, response, and so on. Uh, so what is your vision for to, to what a digital twin uh, uh, is something that should include all physics, or do you think more at different digital twins for different specific applications using uh, simplified models or so on? Yeah, yeah well, uh, I think we have to, well, but this is, again, my, my personal taste. Um, so first of all, the, the global model has been, which is, I mean, a very complex model, uh, has been derived starting from simple models. So it was a kind of upscaling in terms of understanding the complexity. Uh, but then when you have to address the application, the specific request, you have to make a downscale. Because remember, I told you that uh, to solve one single heartbeat, it takes, uh, which is one second of real life, it takes uh, order of days on a big cluster, right? With all possible optimal preconditions that you can put into, into playing. So when you want to provide answers to doctors, you need a much more, uh, say, quicker version of that. Uh, so you have to somehow downscale. But when you know the whole story, you can see which part of your story is relevant for that specific request and which one is less relevant. So the digital twin are actually many dif different digital twins and they're very specified for specific request. So a heart is a very complex mechanism, it's a very complex uh, organ. And you have many different type of pathologies which can uh, show up in a many different forms. And it's better to have models that are tailored on those specific sub pathologies, say, uh, but the way you can manage on, the, on their accuracy and their reliability is, uh, say, the fact that you have behind the model that is capable of describing your story, and then you are in the position of deciding what is relevant and what is not relevant. What can you extract? Which kind of model order reduction, in a general sense, you can operate to give that answer with a certain level of, uh, say, self-confidence. More questions. When comparing your presentation with LNEs, there are plenty of very enlightening uh, similarities. There is one difference, or maybe I missed it in what you have presented. There is the, let's say, the probabilistic aspect of things, Bayesian filtering by LNE, which seems to me extremely important to complement the fact that you'll never get the binary yes, no truth, but you will have to somehow provide some reliability information about what the simulation produces. Yeah, you are right. And you are, you are actually using it. I mean, I, I, I mentioned just very quickly when I was talking about numerical challenges. Uh, yeah, uh, we are using it. We are using it to com we compute sobol indices to get uh, better information about the sensitivity. And we use uh, uncertainty quantification uh, to, to see the way some specific um, 
parameters or coefficients or conditions uh, can have effect on the output. Of course, uh, so we have, we have an arsenal of tools that are used. Of course, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, these partial differential equations are quite complicated, right? They are nonlinear and they are system equations. Uh, so uh, the mathematical arsenal that is available today is not, I would say, rich enough to provide quick and accurate answers uh, to, to this specific context. But we try to isolate those aspects that are more relevant. For instance, we have a certain quantification for the mechanical part, right? Uh, because for the mechanical part, we have a lot of uncertainty on the fibers, for instance, on the properties of the conducibility, of electrical conducibility, on the scarce regions. So there you have uh, UQ algorithms that we are using. Uh, we have uh, UQ algorithms um, at, at the uh, cell levels, uh, where you have the ionic activities. Uh, the ionic activities in the ventricles and the atria are, are behaving in a completely different way. And you have many different models. You have so tens of models available in the literature, and the number of differential equations change dramatically. You have models which are based on a few differential equations and other models that are based on hundreds of differential equations with hundreds of uncertain coefficients. There is where you need to have a more solid uh, ground of understanding. So on selective aspects, we are using UQ. You are not using, for instance, fluid dynamics because uh, these are very strong. Um, I mean, the, the dynamics of the of blood flow uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, is very important. Uh, you have a very strong forces. And for these dynamical systems, it's very difficult to predict the, say, the long-term outcome. But we try to be selective and we try to use it when uh, you actually see that we are plugged by the lack of uh, understanding or the lack of uh, information of data. There is an online question. Thank you very much. So uh, I take the word for Jordan Dojcinov, who is online. Uh, your surrogates will be biased by the training data. My question is how such surrogates can be calibrated to the real-world boundary conditions? Okay. Uh, so boundary conditions. Um, in principle, if we use uh, the model of the heart, uh, you need to put boundary conditions. And you need to put boundary conditions uh, basically on the fluid and also on the mechanics. On the fluid, because if you cut the arteries, you need to guess the flow through these uh, surfaces, which are ideal surfaces. And this is extremely difficult. And that's why we don't do that. We try to connect it with external circulation. So the system is coupled, and you have a feedback mechanism that provides you the boundary conditions. There is, however, another point which is very critical, and this is the way the heart, the pericardium, which is the sac that is surrounding the heart, is, uh, say, in contact with the external, with the rest of the body, with bones, with muscles, and there you need boundary conditions, unless you simulate also the torso, which would take forever. So what we do is to put ideal springs around the pericardial sac, which are there to reproduce the different stiffness of the external tissue. So you have or the differential equations, basically, that are used to reproduce the stiffness of the external, external equation. So um, um, you never use, uh, if I understood the first part of the question, we never used uh, machine, learning, machine learning algorithm exclusively for this type of problems. We always use them in connection with the physics-based models. So when you have boundary conditions and all this information available from physics, we use them. If we don't use, if we don't have them, we try to reconstruct, that, to reconstruct them on the basis of uh, uh, action-reaction principles, so input-output function. So we try to use artificial neural network to have supplementary information. How can we validate them? Uh, very critical issue here. There are very, very few benchmarks available for this type of application. This is not like in aerodynamics or in uh, material science where Maybe you have a laboratory and you can, you can realize uh, benchmarks and having validation uh, uh, quantities. Um, here we try to validate, quote, quote, validate only specific outcomes, specific outputs. And those are on the basis of the specific request that we have to, from, from doctors. If a doctor is interested in a specific answer, then he will be, uh, be also available to produce measurements. And we try to 
compare our results with those available measurements. It's not at all the complete validation in a mathematical sense, because we'll never be able to validate the old system. Today, tomorrow, we don't know. So we try, today, we try to validate it on specific output that there are uh, re specifically requested by, by the clinicians. Okay. Uh, are there more questions? Maybe we take one last question from the audience here. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I just want to go back to one point that you were mentioning. Uh, you've built a very complex model and you know the whole goal of digital twins is to bring answer to specific questions, right? So how does you know the scientist, the mathematician that has built a very complex model interact with uh, those doctors that are asking questions? How, what are the tools and the main challenge that you had into translating what you know in mathematical form and you know in a, in more scientific form to you know the tools of the trade of a doctor? What were the methods you were using? Well, you see, I have uh, white hair. It's a long training, right? I started long ago to discuss not do with doctors, but with uh, other, say, people. And, uh, and I know that at the beginning, uh, you have to invest a lot in uh, try to, uh, not to, uh, well, uh, not to get their level of knowledge, uh, but at least to be able not to say silly things, to attract their interest. And once you attract their interest, then uh, you have uh, very motivated people who are willing to spend their time with you and to exchange their, um, I mean, questions with you, and they're very patient. I mean, we, uh, well, this is just one example. Uh, we collaborate with a professor at the University of Houston in the uh, um, pediatric hospital of Houston, and, uh, and uh, we, are, we are based in Milan now, so there are seven hours of difference, and we, uh, we meet uh, every other week for, uh, and we start at nine in the morning, uh, which means 2 a.m. for him. And every time, every two other week is there and he follows us, right? And then uh, when we close our meeting, uh, he starts his uh, day, right? So um, this to say that it takes time to get the confidence of doctors, inevitably, right? Especially if you're a mathematician, if you're an engineer, it's a bit better. But if you're a mathematician, by definition, we are supposed to do silly things, which may be very funny, but only for yourself. Right? So you, have to, you need to, to, to gain confidence. But then, then you find people who are extremely motivated because they have problems that were not only dictated by research curiosity, which is also very important, of course. They are dictated by what they see in practice. And uh, now we can say that we have, I mean, personally, I have contact with, I don't know, 20, 30 doctors from different environments. And uh, these are long-lasting experience, a long-lasting collaboration. And, uh, and, uh, and that's the way you, um, you operate in it, you go on. So it's not easy, it's a good investment. It's a bit tricky for PhD students, so I, take, I care a lot of responsibility for PhD students because you cannot ask PhD student to, say, to spend one year to get, just get acquainted with. Uh, but, well, I mean, if you have a regional group, you can try to modulate the efforts of different people with different seniority, and, and then the whole thing is accommodated, I would say, smoothly. Okay, thank you. I think this is a good uh, point to stop uh, and, uh, and go for a lunch break. So we thank again uh, thank Professor you. Guartaroni for his talk.